Hey everybody, it's Radha Duval uh, with EXP Realty on this week's episode of Home is What I Do Best um, here at Park Bench Shorewood. And we're here with uh, Nat Devour. Devour, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Who is the owner or co owner? Owner. Owner of Draft and Vessel. And so we wanted to pick his brain a little bit about. Um, how his business came about to be in Shorewood. It's very beautiful in here, as you can all see. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, the origin of this cool, quaint, cozy little sure. pub. Yeah, it's, it's unique in the sense, um, I imagine most places have a plan, you know, and a strategy and business plan even. Um, for me, I have the building and Oakland Avenue was sort of starting to get a little busier when I first got the building moved here. It was a dead zone, pretty much. The, and when was that? This would be 2008, <clears throat> nine. There was not a single um, person walking down the street, maybe one or two. Wow. And then uh, I just noticed um, once Colectivo went in down there, it really changed because you had Pick and Save and Colectivo, and I'd open the door and literally be surprised to see two or three people, and uh, that immediately I thought, wow, there's a couple of people out there, like, <laughs> should go into business, because um, again, I had the uh, spaces. And why did you have the space? Uh, about the building, okay. and the, Good you know, timing. it was interesting, because it's losing a building in Whitefish Bay, mm. so I was on the losing side of that whole <laughs> fallout, but then, you know, um, <laughs> was over here within a year, yeah. trying to pick up, uh, and, and sort of take advantage of that situation. Mm -hmm. And this building was just an interesting, weird building uh, in foreclosure, kind of, and it had multiple units. And I've rented property before, and I'm kind of a fixer-upper type of guy, so I'm like, I'll live in there, and I'll just fix everything up, and I, it'll be easy to manage. So there are four units. We're sitting in the one commercial unit, and another one was over there, and then there were two residential. Mm -hmm. And so I live right behind the wall there, um, and you know, for we opened in 2014, so for about five years it was all rented out, and that was great. I'm a photographer by trade, so I freelance photography and then just kind of working on this building. And, do you do real estate? Um, I mean, I don't do it, but we had a place in Madison, uh, and we had rented that since like 2003. Mm -hmm. So again, I was familiar with um, property investment and I mean, working on in stuff. In terms of photography. Oh. Um, <laughs> Or what's your I mean, I do a lot of people. That's okay. kind of, I did portrait studios for a while, a lot of weddings. And at this point, I was working freelance at Colts, which mm -hmm. is a big photo studio in Brown Deer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's great, and it's beautiful, and it's, you know, good money. But yeah. it's a big corporation. And for a guy who grew up on a dairy farm, you're just not used to corporations. You're just not comfortable in that zone. You're always just looking for some way to kind of do your own thing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think it's not even conscious. I think it's just subconsciously attracted toward being in charge of your own schedule and stuff like yeah, that. Because you've never so seen much. anybody, you know, all the people around you work all day, but they're no, there's no boss telling them to. They just do it on their own. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's just baked into um, Wisconsin. me and my brother, just farmers, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. You want to work hard, but you also don't want to be told to work hard. Right. <laughs> you want to work hard because you choose to work hard. Right, that's just what you do here. That's what you do. <laughs> Um, and, you know, we're not, we didn't stay on the farm, so you just take that, that with you. And, um, so what made you want to open a brewery? Or yeah, a, a little pub? A bar, this? yeah. So we don't brew anything. Um, some people think we do, but this is the whole space, so there's obviously no room for a brewery in here. It's really a beautiful design. Yeah. It's very contemporary. Yeah. I mean, I've lived in New York and LA and Europe, and it's just perfect. This yeah, could we, be anywhere. What's funny is we get a lot of that. Like this could be in, and then people mm -hmm. often list yeah. New York. Somewhere right now. And the word <laughs> Tennessee. The word Europe comes up a lot. Uh -huh. um, this feels uh, European. Mm -hmm. Like and I often take that as a big compliment. Um, because I've traveled a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, I've lived in other countries and I've been around the world. There's a couple years where I did nothing but backpack around. Yes. And um, of course I bring a lot of, you know, that's mm -hmm. a nice antithesis to America. Mm -hmm. And of course, you're walking in a bar in Wisconsin in America, 
you're going to have a certain expectation of what that is. And maybe go on vacation to Europe and come back and like, those bars are European. But really, they're just not all sports bars. They're not right. all big, you know. They tend to be smaller, and they tend to be, you know, based on socializing more than, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the standard American bar is. So, again, I think it's almost subconscious that people think, that's European, but really they're just reacting to it's small and there's no TVs. That makes it feel like a European experience. Mm -hmm. um, so, <clears throat> yeah, there wasn't a, again, like I started saying, there wasn't like a business plan and I've always wanted to have a bar or I have any interest in having bars. It was more like have a building and I feel like I want to do something mm -hmm. because the street's getting popular and I'm getting sick of working in this corporate environment. Um, I have an art degree, you know, a background in different creative endeavors. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was more like, I want to have a creative space. Like I want to design a space and go up and put it mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. um, the bar aspect was kind of like, that's a good reason to do it. Uh, before it was going to be gelato, like the first idea was a gelato mm -hmm. shop. I thought that would be cool too. And yeah. it would probably look exactly the same. Yeah. Because it was, the, the idea was, this is what it will look like, and I want to do this space. because it's a fun yeah. project. Mm -hmm. um, but I was into getting more and more into craft beer at the time. Um, I heard you had to wake up early to make gelato. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, I'm not waking up at five every day to make gelato, forget it. Um, so that was actually the deciding factor for uh, ice cream. It was a growler place. So when it started, there was a mall here. It was just this little size. It was about 350 square feet, which, again, having no real experience in bars, and I mean, to be honest, I didn't really go to many bars, even at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't really drink until pretty, you know, um, recently? not recently, but, you know, late 20s. Oh, okay. Um, compared to, some, you know, some kids, yeah. Some Wisconsinites, you know. I went to UW Madison. <laughs> yeah. I didn't go to any bars at all, you know, for the yeah. whole time I was there. So again, it's not like I had a good reference point. That's the interesting thing. And in a, in a funny hindsight way, unintentionally, I think that is helpful because there's nothing to guide the idea. It was just like, I'm going to do this thing. Um, I like beer. Let's, let's do a bar. And people are like, oh, this is different. This is unique. And it's like, oh, really? <laughs> you know? Was it difficult to get all of the, get past all the red tape that you have to get through to open a commercial space, especially like the liquor license. <clears throat> it, yeah, the liquor license was not difficult because it was a beer only license. Mm -hmm. So um, okay. again, it was done on the cheap. Okay. Um, and you know, a, a full liquor license is not only expensive, it's a complicated establishment with right. a lot of expensive mm -hmm. liquor and you know, mm -hmm. um, the logistics are uh, mm -hmm. something right. I was just unfamiliar with. but. A draft system is pretty simple. You know, nice. you bring kegs in, you plug them in, and you pour them back out. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, and a beer license is easy to get. But you don't see any bars that have nothing but beer because nobody really wants that license. Mm -hmm. So it's available and it's cheap. Um, so when we opened, that's all there was. If mm -hmm. you didn't like beer, we didn't really even have water. Like, sorry, that's all, <laughs> that's all we have. So. Um, we definitely established it as a place for beer nerds. Okay. Um, nice. And that was great. Since we've added a lot of things, and the funny thing is it's a little hard now to turn the ship around because we'll still have people walking and go, you guys have wine and cocktails now? Yeah. We do have a full license, but you know, five years later, people, I didn't know you had wine. Like, yeah. yeah, we had wine for years and years, but we really did a good job establishing this as a beer place <laughs> so well that nobody even knows that you can get other things here. So, so what kind of marketing have you done over the years? Um, again, the original concept was so um, shoestring mm -hmm. that there wasn't like budget for anything. I <laughs> built it out. Mouth. I did pretty much everything there was to do. The hard part wasn't the license. The hard part was more like inspectors. Mm -hmm. So building inspector would be like, who, who did all this? You know, yep. mm -hmm. I did it. And like, yeah, well, you're not really right, licensed right. to do any of this. It's like, yeah, well, I can't afford anybody. Uh, is, that's where it's going to be. Um, so there was some building trust there with mm -hmm. the inspector mm -hmm. that, you know, this will be okay. It won't be, you know, I think they think an owner is just going to be yeah. in here making a yeah. shabby um, 
uh, dump, and I think they were like, oh, oh it's, it's <laughs> nice, okay, I guess yeah. you, know, you get a license. Um, yeah, I know how that is. We, so I'm not only a realtor, but um, I'm a real estate investor, my husband, I told you, is a contractor, and so we have to deal with that all the time. And he, he's a, he's a carpenter. I mean, he's a great skilled, yeah. you know, craftsman, and he likes to restore these beautiful buildings in Milwaukee. And then you have to deal with the inspectors. <laughs> yeah, I all have come time. a long way there. And for me, you know, my skill, I'm more like, you know, I have farm skills. Like cool. you just kind of pick yeah. up how to fix stuff, but mm -hmm. you're not a licensed plumber or electrician yeah. or anything like that. So yeah, if you want to make sure, you know, get electrocuted, Probably one higher electrician <laughs> or HVAC right. or something like yeah. that. But like trim stuff, yeah, that's where it's like I'm definitely can do all that because you know you can kill yourself, mm -hmm. and there isn't necessarily hardcore code around details. Yeah, you know, um, so it's been a balancing act there. And uh, again, the the biggest factor was that it had to be like zero risk, and I think. You know, in the big picture, that's maybe what was behind doing it at all. You know, again, it, it really wasn't like, I want to open a franchise or start right. a business or be an entrepreneur or have a store wow. or get into retail, like none of that. It was more like, I, I want to do something space. fun and creative mm -hmm. with this space mm -hmm. that was not being used to its full potential. And um, I, I didn't want to spend a penny on it and I didn't want any chance that it could go badly you know so if you have if you do all the work yourself and you basically have no money on the line and the worst case scenario is you rent it back out mm -hmm. like you just did there's really no you know disaster scenario and that's what I was afraid of so I mean the interesting thing was it seems risky like oh you just you know you would open a bar out of nowhere it seems like taking a risk but it really wasn't it was the opposite you know, it was zero of, risk yeah it seems like a lot of business owners in the community do have some skill sets that the average person doesn't, and those are the ones that have succeeded and like made it through COVID and all that kind of thing. Imagination, you know, some maybe building skills, certain life skills that not everybody else has acquired over the years. So, how have you, you know, what's your impression of Shorewood and how it's evolved over these? What has it been like? Yeah, I moved here in 06 and then bought this place in 08 right at the crash. Um, 06 was just renters who found a place that was cheaper than the east side because where I was living on the east side, for whatever reason, we found this house in Shorewood that was even cheaper. We, yeah. Otherwise, we wouldn't have moved to Shorewood. We were like, whoa, Shorewood, like, no way. We live on the east side. You know, but it was like, this is really cheap. So <laughs> we did move up here. And then, uh, I guess we kind of got used to living here, didn't have kids or anything, just Ooh. printing. Um, and then I'm walking around because, you know, you live here now. So I'm walking up and down Oakland, there's a sign on the window, like, oh, that place is for sale, that'd be cool if you get in there and, you know, walk around and like, yeah, I think I can pull that off. Wow, um, good for you. Like I mentioned, we bought a house in um, Whitefish, Whitefish Bay, Bay. and mm -hmm. as a realtor, you'd find that, I find it interesting because <laughs> it was, we are a statistic in the sense um, that was like 07 mm -hmm. before any issues mm -hmm. in the market. And it was like, hey, uh, we're looking for a house. Because <clears throat> everybody's buying houses, 06, 07, it was madness. It's yeah, kind of yeah. like it is now. Like, you just got to have one. Yeah. You just got to have a mm -hmm. house. Uh, so we were like, yeah, I got, even though we got this great rental, it's like, we got to buy a house. Okay. And, um, they, they said, oh, what do you do? Freelance photographer. Okay, so we, you don't know how much you make? Like, not really. You know, yeah, like, it changes. Like, uh -huh, okay, you're sure. unverified. Well, how much money do you have to put down? Nothing. We have no money. Yeah. Okay, zero money down, unverified income. Which house? That one? Sold. You know, it oh was that God. easy. Yeah. And then we get it, and it's immediately like, we can't afford to live here. <laughs> um, so we rented it out. I can't imagine. Immediately. Never lived in it. Yeah. Within a year, that person lost their job, market crashed, and we were like, we got to get rid of this house. It's, you know. So, I mean... That was within a year, and then of course, on the flip side, this place was going through the same thing. And we're walking around, and again, banks, mortgage companies were going out of business by the day, and you know there were many loans against this building, so you could just show up and be like, 
here's what I got, you know, mm -hmm. and banks were like, well, we'll, we'll take anything because we don't know what's happening here. Oh, wow. um, it wasn't like a steal, but it was a good deal. And it was just ironic that we were on efficiently in a self-contained you know situation where again I'm sort of in charge of you know, my space and my time um, which is you know real estate investment and ownership and management mm -hmm. isn't for everybody because yeah. some people are um, you know they would just be calling uh, trades people all day long mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like you, that would be stressful if yeah, you can fix most like everything space, right? it's great and you're on yeah. a site oh that's not working Up, you run down, up come it. down it's not like yeah yeah it's not like you're walking doesn't cost you anything mm -hmm. and i like doing that and that's i think that's sort of the fun thing like you wake up and you're a problem solver yeah, like right. what's broke what can mm -hmm. i what can i do cool. interesting so so what is like what's a good day to come in here if you want to really well friday's the biggest day and i mean friday i, I say like a we opened and it was just kind of like, I don't know, let's sell some beer. It might be cool. I like craft beer. And it was good timing for the market. But again, I, it wasn't based on a real mm -hmm. plan of any sorts. Um, but seven years in now, um, obviously, we have experience. I have experience. I'm more aware of you know, how the business works. It started, it was really meant to be growlers to go because growlers were sort of in a thing. Right. And it was kind of cool. But then it was, yeah, yeah, and that's what we were coming in with, like not a bar. You come in, it was a to-go place. But there was a bar you could sit down, and everybody wanted to sit down. Mm -hmm. and pretty soon, yes, we sold a lot of growlers, but we had a lot of people that wanted to hang out in here and grab a glass. Mm -hmm. And at this point now, we still do a lot of growlers, but we do way more on-premise sales, essentially a bar. Is that just because the area has... No, because people like it and they want to be in here. Right. You know, we, yeah. didn't, we didn't know that. It wasn't um, so it wasn't a part of the plan. It's like, this would be a cool place where you come in, fill your growler, and leave. And yeah. It's like a fun little boutique grocery store. And people like, yeah, actually, I'm not hanging out and drinking. Are they mostly really local people? Like, do you walk in? Or do you get yep, so out? we started very, very local. You know, to the point you had asked about marketing, um, and I was saying there isn't any it's not mm -hmm. social media because again, I don't want to spend money on anybody, right. especially marketing, because it's yeah. like, is that money worth it? Where is it yeah, going? Yeah, right. um, so we did Kickstarter. That was sort of cool back then. And Kickstarter's like a little, I have done that, but mm -hmm. that's when it was sort of at its peak. So it was a Kickstarter thing where people kind of had heard about them and this thing coming, what is it? It's in that little space. I heard it's on Kickstarter. <laughs> so it did create a buzz. Cool. Um, there might have been a article or two somebody picked up on it about a kid's you know kids yeah. media likes that yeah. uh, and then the people involved have this feeling of ownership so it felt kind of like it was the community's nice thing. Yeah. and you know people it wasn't a chain and it obviously wasn't even a typical idea it wasn't even like you walk and be like <clears throat> yeah it's a bar and we watch the packers there and we took them the bike <clears throat> that was never going to be a part of it so once people walked in it's like this isn't even something I recognize. What is this exactly? How did you come up with the name? Um, I don't know. I mean, there's sort and of this. So, so draft and vessel, and then there's like the skeleton. Reminds me. There's is a bear. The bear logo is, is kind of our book. You can see right there. But it was originally called craft and vessel because a craft beer. Mm -hmm. And you know, the this and that, this ampersand that is sort of a cliche hipster trend name, you know, mm -hmm. and it was just, that was the thing at the time, this and that. Um, so uh, it was called Craft, and then there was a place in Dallas that sent us a cease and desist letter, because they were crafting something. And we had printed up all our stuff, t-shirts, and all our Kickstarter items that you could get for Kickstarting. You know, this guy was like, you, you have to change the name or I'm going to sue you. <laughs> and at the time, it was like, you've ruined us. You've, you know, ruined the whole business. We're going to go out of business, we're, you know, whatever. That's how it felt. Mm -hmm. And of course, it was really nothing. nothing. We just switched it to D. And it was 
draft, and everybody's like, yeah, that's better anyway. I'm like, yeah, it probably is better. And then everybody in the Kickstarter got these t-shirts and growlers that say craft investor, and they're all still out there. And most people feel like, like people still come in, like, I got my craft investor growler. It's sort of like the OG yeah, yeah, yeah. material. Like, cool. Exactly. Yeah, so it became a funny story, and you know, people had, um, you know, people, some people remember that story. And again, when we opened, we were really, really small, and two years in, we had expanded because it got too busy, too fast, kind of. Um, again, th not knowing anything. I think I did the math and was like, we need to profit 40 bucks a day. Like, if we can't do better than $40 a profit per day, this has got enough. Mm -hmm. But that was like the bottom line. So we just had no idea. It could have been nothing. Could have been one person a day who walks in and gets a beer and like, okay, I guess we But can. somehow it worked out. Well, yeah, I mean, within like three or four days, there were 30 people in but here. Because it, you know, it sort of was like this secret new thing. And it wasn't exactly. big. So everybody got, you know, came in to see the this new thing. And it was crowded. There was nowhere to sit. Uh, our occupancy was 12, which we still have a little sign to keep up on the wall there. Because we had our occupancy of 12. You know, oh, including our cool. number. That's like Chumley's in New York. Yeah, so it was, <laughs> and you know, it was over occupancy like every single evening. Right. Um, <laughs> and again, this was the bar kind of there, and then you had the wall, a few chairs and a few chairs. And we had one bathroom. And the main problem was, the inspector again was really like, with one bathroom, <laughs> you can't have any more than 12 people. Uh, the so, inspectors. Yeah, we had to add a bathroom, which means we had needed more yeah. space. Yeah. And we had no other space. <laughs> So there was a place called the Wax Wing over here. Um, you bought it? Well, I rented it to them. Yeah, you rented it to them. So we basically nice. expanded in that space. There was uh, a lot of drama about that in the news, maybe. Oh. Um, the story was basically the evil landlord uh, bar <laughs> owner kicked out this charming art uh, craft store, you know. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it. It was more like an opportunity. They were also very small, and they had lines out the, the door. door. Interesting, um, yeah. And it was very symbiotic, but at this point, I don't know, we thought we were going to get shut down entirely because we didn't have a bathroom to suit the people, and they were just going to come in and say, that's it, you know, you're over capacity, shut it down. So, you know, we really did all we could to help them grow and us grow, and that is what happened. Maxwing went down to the corner of North, um, did really well, you know, we mm -hmm. expanded. Everybody grew. Um, it was just popular. Great. Quick, you know, it was hard to grow that fast. Mm -hmm. um, and Are you one of the only um, pubs that has growlers, or do some of the others on the strip here? Not really officially. I, think, so. I think during COVID, everybody was like, how um, do we how do, we do liquor sales yeah. with, you know, without people in here? And maybe they looked at growlers a little bit, but, you know, we were already established mm -hmm. as that because mm -hmm. we've been doing it for six years um, because it was the original business model. So the mm -hmm. COVID, what's interesting about COVID is, you know, our pivot wasn't trying to find a new way to operate. It was literally just pivoting back to the original way to operate, mm -hmm. which was growlers to go. That yeah. was what it was on day That's one. Cool. Um, so we just, you know, the very next day after lockdown, we didn't change anything. It was immediately Completely grow this off, which is not open for in you know uh, on premise seating. Yeah. And you know, in this day, it just kind of stayed open that way. Um, so that was very convenient. And we still do a bunch and there are, you know, the, the, the industry is changing. The amount of breweries that have opened in Milwaukee since we opened is you know crazy. When we opened the Milwaukee beer scene was not amazing. <clears throat> we had just recently. Yeah, over the time we've been open, there's just been, you know, multiple breweries a year, and now there's award-winning breweries, there's mm -hmm. every, you know, there's different breweries focusing on different types of beer, mm -hmm. specializing in, in things, you know, Madison had a better beer scene, Minneapolis had a better beer scene, Milwaukee had this historical beer legacy, but no good modern beer scene. Cool, yeah. And then all of a sudden, that modern beer scene took off, and now Milwaukee's really special because it has both, mm -hmm. you know. Um, in a way, you know, pulled ahead of Madison, places from, even like Indeed, from Minneapolis, it's like, oh, we need to open a place in Milwaukee. Which, which is, they did, right? They my, did. My neighbor, <clears throat> well, he teaches my kids music. Do you know Gabe, who, he's uh, in Smoke and Mirrors, the band? No. I think they play there regularly. So 
so you know, I think we're going to go like Friday, December 3rd or something. Yeah. But indeed, I haven't been there yet. But you're saying that's I haven't from been Minneapolis? There either, but it's, it, no, it's from Minneapolis. Oh, Minneapolis. Okay. And, you know, the cool thing was that at the time, the Minneapolis beer scene was really great. You know, and so was Madison's. Mm -hmm. And in a way, Milwaukee had this inferiority complex <laughs> about beer, you know, which yeah. is funny. Um, but now you have both Madison and Minneapolis breweries coming to Milwaukee because it has this explosion of great craft beer, but it's on top of a foundation of historical beer cred that no one else can claim. Mm -hmm. Minneapolis, Madison, nobody has the history of beer that Milwaukee has. Right. So to have both is key, and it puts Milwaukee in a really good position you know, to be the real beer city, both Absolutely. historically and uh, with craft beer. I mean, I told you, and it sounds like you've lived several places around the world, Europe, namely, um, and so have I, but um, I just think this is a great town. It has so much to offer, and um, there's all these little pockets and boroughs that have something unique to offer, you know, and you're right here in the heart of it. I, um, I need to come in more often, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you, Mark. Yeah, it is. We like the idea uh, of being, you know, a best kept secret sort of place. Yeah, that's cool. We are, you know, at this point. It's like bring your friends. <laughs> this, yeah, don't, the first rule is don't tell anybody about it. But, <laughs> that's um, how our tennis club is, the RTC. Yeah, no it, one knows about it. Exactly. <laughs> and it, that did work well. Um, now, with, with everything opening, I mean, you look on social media and follow beer places in Milwaukee, yeah. and it's like, it's a pretty full list of scrolling through Stop. everybody's it's daily, much, right? Well, I mean, it's great it's if you're great. a customer, it's but great. you can no longer be the one good yeah. place that has good beer. Well, you are like, amongst. It's, yeah, it's like reading the language to the social media. It's just like, you know, what pops out <laughs> now because nothing pops out. Anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so. So going, but it's great, of course. I mean, I have to do it. It's, yeah. It's encouraged, but um, there's nothing like just being face to face, meeting someone. Um, learning about the business and you educating me on why this is such a cool place and I should come here on a regular basis and yeah. have a brew. Yeah, this is unique because you kind of come into, it's bigger than it used to be. Uh, it used to be microscopic, now it's just small. Um, but again, no TVs, yeah. usually yeah. one bartender and even though... Ah, no TVs, to, yeah. Yeah, it's hard to tell you are very close to the bartender, I mean within a foot or two, which You'll probably notice that other bars there's much more space between you and everything back there, including the person. That's a cool um, detail. So yeah. people, there's a intimacy that's automatic being here physically with the bartender or other customers, and many people leave and say, you know, aside from that oh, European or whatever. It's a cafe feel, yeah. They're like, man, I had uh, the greatest conversation there or whatever because you aren't distracted, mm -hmm. you aren't kind of by, you aren't physically removed either from the person next to you mm -hmm. or the bartender, you're often, before COVID anyway, crammed in. You know, someone's trying to order behind you and they are pushing up against your shoulder and yeah. they're like, how's that weird yeah. sour? And then you say, oh, it's good, I'm drinking it right now. And all of a sudden these two people are chatting and the bartender is, you know, a foot and a half away from you. And then all of a sudden you can have everybody in one conversation and, you know, it just kind of naturally happens because of the space. Uh, and then people go, man, I just had a great conversation that night. Rather than maybe a more typical bar, it's unlikely you're going to end up in an intimate conversation with a stranger um, mm -hmm. in that way. So that's what's kind of nice about it from a community thing. So people come in here to see um, other community members and other regulars, you know, mm -hmm. kind of socialize because it's a good place to, you know, have a conversation, I guess. Yeah, it's a super local place. Um, all right, well, you've said a lot. Um, what do you love most about the neighborhood? Uh, well, now, like I said, I came here because I was cheap and I found a cheap house, <laughs> and that was the only reason I was here. Now I have four kids, and they're in Sherwood school system. Are so they? Yeah. now, if you ask me what I'm doing here, you know, I'm putting kids in a school system. Right. That's like the main that worked reason well. to. Uh, <laughs> to do all this, you know? Yeah. Um, so I do love the schools. I love the, you know, what, what the community is for for growing up in, you know, because mm -hmm. that's kind of my priority. It's walkable, be 
beach, the river, you know, the farmer's market, biking. So much offer. It's all yeah. stuff I like to do with the kids. Um, I grew up in a, you know, a big farm, way out in the country. I had a lot of land, but there were no neighbors. Mm -hmm. And I have to try to readjust and be like, okay, this growing up here is going to be different <laughs> than me. You're going to be surrounded by a million people yeah. all on the same little bit of land. Um, and it's, you know, it's fun figuring out the upside of all of that, you know, because obviously there is one. Um, and I think Sherwood's pretty good, pretty good mix, you know, like I said, we were up to Whitefish Bay a little bit. We started on the east side, south of UWM, and it was like, I love it. Cool. Mm -hmm. In fact, I came from Madison, and initially, it's kind of a longer story because it was, I loved Madison, and I did not like Milwaukee at all. I did not want to move to Milwaukee, because Madison was perfect. Okay. And if you've lived in Madison, you're in this bubble, and you're this is yeah. perfect so little bubble. I like your bubble. You like it. the bubble. I get it. And Milwaukee was like, oh, this is a little too real. <laughs> and uh, but right when I got here, I think we just got lucky. It was like oh three, oh two, and they built the art museum. It was just oh, getting built. Yeah. yeah, and you're like, that is the coolest building I've ever seen. And then year over year since two thousand and two. Like you said, every little neighborhood starts to get better. Downtown gets better. The beach got better. There's better restaurants. All of a sudden, breweries are getting better. Right. All of a sudden, you're just riding this wave for the last 19 years um, that's just better and better. And then I, then I look back, and I'm like, man, that, the timing was really good. And of course, about five years in, I started to be like, you know what? I think I like Milwaukee more than Madison. And then I sort of switched. Uh, and it's like, yeah, Madison's like small and insular. And it's like, you, you see all the negative things about the mm -hmm. bubble, you see all the positive things about a more complicated, bigger city. Uh, so then it really grew on me, and I kind of noticed like, good things are happening in Milwaukee. Um, still challenges, of course, but if you look at the long-term picture, the last 20 years have been a really great growth period in all the things that make a city fun. You know, like I said, food, you know, Entertainment. Parks, entertainment, mm -hmm. um, even the architecture. The natural outdoor, um, op you know, options and entertainment. I mean, it just seems like you know, Wisconsinites live in the outdoors more so than, we'll say, a California girl like myself. Mm -hmm. Or, well, I was outside a lot, but I mean, you guys like to hike and ski, and my husband introduced me to skiing. You know, mm -hmm. and then you can go to the lake, and it's five minutes, not a half hour, like yeah. it is if you live in Chicago. Exactly. You know, yeah, and you it can just surf on the lake. You can no. surf and the quality of life here is excellent. Um, there's a huge European influence in the real estate and architecture, too, which we love, you know. You just get so much more bang for your buck you can living in Milwaukee. Your buck. <coughs> yeah. if, you, if you understand, if you've been elsewhere, yeah. I guess, yeah. that's, it's usually really jumps out at you when you've seen these things, but they've either been harder or farther or more expensive or something, and it's like, oh yeah, I can go to a James Beard restaurant, the lakefront, you know, a world-class art museum and a show, and I can do that in a day, affordably, that's like, yeah, there's you know, not places you can pull that all off. I live close by, I'm in River West, but um, there's something about Shorewood that kind of has like an East Coast feel to me, you know? I lived on the East Coast and went to, to college there, and um, it's just, it's very beautiful, yeah, there's a great, great quality of life. Yeah. I, maybe the lake is the biggest thing, you know, and if someone were to ask me what's so great about Shorewood, um, you know, it does have this sort of progressive, fun, you know, it's fully European, but, you know, it's got this little right. commercial district, it is close, and everything's walkable, I see a lot of um, bikes, which is, you know, all of that kind of lends itself toward that. Um, but the coastal feel, so the idea that yeah, you have exactly. in your mind, you're kind of on a coast. Yeah, totally. It changes <laughs> how you live. You're like, I'm in a coastal Absolutely. city. Absolutely. Even though you're like, really, you're on a lake. It's like, no, no, mentally it feels like you're in a coastal city. It's a big lake. Yeah. yeah. As you move around, there's just always this body of water, and you're always interacting with it, whether it's just driving downtown. You know, I so usually great. take lake drive because I just want to have that yeah. feeling. Yeah. The weather patterns in the winter and summer, you get to notice the waves and the sunrises and how it changes each each day can be totally different yeah um, it's a healthy lifestyle and um what's i mean say just a, a smart hard-working like educated it lures that type of person who i feel like is a is maybe a farmer from wisconsin you know yeah but smart i mean there's a lot of competition here i love it i love the schools here we have two kids 
and um, they're out in a suburb now at a private school called Brookfield Academy, and okay. it's My challenging. My mother went there. Yeah, it's a good school, but you know what? Um, because we're on the east side here, we may we may move them over into the Sherwood School District. So we'll see. But um, I just feel like it's a great place to raise kids. There's great things for the adults. <laughs> yeah. For small business, you know. Yeah. Um, there's a great community here, and um, thank you so much for doing the interview. Sure. I know you're busy. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, we're here at Draft and Vessel. It was such a great interview, and um, please check it out at parkbench.com Shorewood, and uh, we'll see you next week at Home is What I Do Best. Thank you so much.